This is the official podcast of Bridge United, a program of the Bridge Youth Ministries, uniting the hearts of youth with the heart of God. Is everyone situated? You guys don't want to talk that much? Cool. All right. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start off today just by repeating what my wife said. I think... Uh, we can all speak for, I can speak for everybody here at the bridge when I say we're very excited for this new year. 2014 is going to be unbelievable. 2014 is going to be uh, bigger than you can possibly imagine. 2014, we're going to ask you to kind of unscrew your heads, pull your imagination out, and stretch it beyond what you've ever done before. We're going to ask you to take everything you've ever dreamed and throw it out the window and start dreaming bigger dreams. 2014 is going to be a gigantic year, and we're starting it off with a topic that we're calling This Is Your God. But before we do that, I want to ask you guys to poke yourselves in the eye. I want to make sure you have them. This is important because we're going to be talking about your eyes today the whole time. Everything we talk about is going to have to do with what you see. Does everyone have eyes? I didn't see you poke your eyes. Can you poke your eyes? There you go. Do you have eyes? All right, good. I'm going to show you some pictures. Use this screen. That screen's booty. Not good. Sorry, he's recording me, so I can't say words of booty on this. I said it twice. I said booty three times now. He can edit it. Booty. Okay. Uh, I want you to look at the screen. We're going to show you this first picture. I want to ask you guys what you see. Don't say it right away. Just look at it. Just look at the picture. You may have seen this before. And then let's start talking about what do you see? What do you see? You see a bunny? What do you see, sir? A rabbit and a duck. Does everyone see the rabbit and the duck? Rabbit and a duck. Okay, Billy, let's see the next picture. What do you see there? What is that? An old lady? That's your grandmother? Dee, that's crazy. What do you see? Albert Einstein? Albert Einstein? Who sees Albert Einstein? Who sees a grandmother? Okay, okay, but what if we were to flip that upside down, Billy? Then what would we see? Then what would we see? Do you not have that? He doesn't have that picture. Laverne Billy, who's Laverne and who is Shirley? And why are you talking about that? Yeah, if you flip upside down, what do you see? A princess. You see a princess. Don't worry about it, Billy. Don't, don't stress out over the picture. It's not that big a deal. All right, so we see in one way when we look at it, we see an old lady. In the other way when we flip and look at it, we see a beautiful young woman, much like my wife, Janelle. All right, next picture, Billy. Next picture. All right, who do you see there? What's Abraham Lincoln doing? He's looking at you, right? You see Abraham Lincoln looking at you. But what if we flip this one upside down? Then what do we see? All of a sudden, his eyes close. Go back to the first one. Same picture. His eyes are open. But then we flip it upside down. What is this dark sorcery? What is this? Evil magic. No. Next picture. It all matters on how you look at it. Okay, what do you guys see? Billion dollar owner, Apple computer. Rest his soul. You see the Apple logo, but what the artist did here is beautifully. In the middle where there's usually a bite, he put Steve Jobs' face. It's a message. So it all depends on what you're looking at and how you look at it. So what's the next picture, William? What do you guys see? A lady floating. Is she actually floating, though? No. We see a flagpole shadow on the sand. Next picture. We're going to start moving faster. Oh, this one's fun. This one drives me banana sandwiches. What do you see, Marcus? What do you see? Speaking the mic, what do you see? Uh, a beach. Mm -hmm. <laughs> a walkway, some grass. Some no, you're wrong. All right, what do you guys see? How many, how many people see water? How many people see a wall? Billy, go to the next slide. That looks like a lake if you put a boat in it, right? Suddenly it's water. What if we switch, Billy? What if it's the next thing? You put jingles on it, my cat. And it suddenly becomes a wall. What the? What? What, you guys aren't impressed? Seriously? You want me to juggle now? Goodness gracious. Next one. Oh. What do you guys see now? Cake. Those are cups of hot chocolate. Next picture. Next picture. Or is it? It's cake. I fooled you. Okay, that one wasn't good. All right, next one. I think we're getting to the end here. What do you guys see? A squirrel with nuts. Is that really what you see? What else do you see? 
A lady's face. You see Marcus's face. No, I'm just playing, man. I was just kidding, bro. That was too soon. A lady's face. Who sees the lady's face and the squirrels? Oh, I'm like a magician. You guys don't see the face? Look, you got the eye and then the mouth with the, the eye and the mouth. Okay, next one. What do you guys see here? It's a person holding a magnifying glass, right? All right, a coffee cup. You're obsessed with coffee. Is that, oh, is that, a, we're recording this one. You can't say things like that. Is that a magnifying glass? Who sees a magnifying glass? Who sees a cup of coffee? Oh, okay, see? So it all depends on how obsessed you are and addicted to caffeine you are, what you're going to see for this picture. Sonia immediately saw coffee. Is this mine? This water? Wait, you're recording the service now? No. Is this broken? You're killing me. What's the next one, Billy? This one's important, I think. What do you guys see when you look at that, huh? What do you see when you look at that? See, if Janelle was looking at it, she would see a handsome, charming, very good-looking man. Now, for some of you looking at it, you might not feel the same way. It all depends on what you're looking at and how you see it. I know where you live. So today we're going to be talking about what it is that you see. And it's a very important thing for us to talk about because what we see and how we frame the things that we're seeing really dictates what we tend to believe and what we tend to do with our lives. Would you guys agree? I don't know what that means. Yes. Let's bow our heads real quick. Father God, I just ask that you would lead us in this, uh, in this conversation that we have, God, that we would begin to see things the way you see them and that we would open our eyes and be willing to see something that we normally wouldn't. In Jesus' name, amen. How many of you guys here know what holiday we're celebrating tomorrow? It's a Christian holiday. Anyone know? Anyone? No, Mike. You're like Christian, man. I can't ask you. Huh? What's that? Three Kings Day, he says. Three Kings Day. Who else knows it is Three Kings Day? On the church calendar, you still have school, I'm sorry. On the church calendar, it's not called Three Kings Day. It's actually called, Leslie? The Epiphany. Everyone say, the Epiphany. No, you didn't say it like I said. Say, the Epiphany. The Epiphany. What is the Epiphany? See, the Epiphany is a Christian holiday on the traditional Christian calendar from the Eastern Church. Not really something that's so modern. It's quite old, actually. And what it really is, it's four different occurrences that happen in the life of Jesus, and we celebrate them all on this day. I actually learned something new as I was studying this. I didn't know it was four things. I thought it was just Three Kings Day. I thought it was just when the wise men came to visit Jesus. But it's also the baptism of Jesus Christ. It's also the birth of Jesus Christ, as well as the first miracle that he ever performed. So Christians have this holiday called the Epiphany, where they celebrate these four things. Now, as time has gone on, different sects and parts of Christianity started celebrating different aspects of it. And what we really know now, traditionally, as the Epiphany would actually be called Three Kings Day by you. So what happened on Three Kings Day, on the Epiphany? What happened that we celebrate? Anyone? Anyone? What's up, man? The wise men came to Jesus, the wise men. Has anyone ever heard that story? There's three wise men, and they travel far. Uh, they, they, what was it? They traversed the far, bearing gifts, and they brought these gifts to Jesus and all that stuff. Have you guys ever heard that story? We're going to take the time. We're actually going to read it. It's not that long. I want you guys to get in groups real quick. Get in groups real quick. Make sure there is an adult in one of the groups, in all the groups. And Billy is going to put on the screen the scripture verses that pertain to this story. So actually what I'm going to do is I'm going to read it to you, and then I want you guys, you're going to discuss a couple of questions that Billy is going to put on the screen. So let me read it for you. Everyone listen up. Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea during the reign of King Herod. About that time, some wise men from eastern lands arrived in Jerusalem asking, where is the newborn king of the Jews? We saw his star as it rose, and we have come to worship him. King Herod was deeply disturbed when he heard this, as was everyone in Jerusalem. 
He called a meeting of the leading priests and teachers of religious law and asked, where is the Messiah supposed to be born? In Bethlehem in Judea, they said, for this is what the prophet wrote. And you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judea, are not least among the ruling cities of Judah, for a ruler will come from you who will be the shepherd for my people Israel. Then Herod called for a private meeting with the wise men, and he learned from them the time when the first star appeared. Then he told them, go to Bethlehem and search carefully for the child. And when you find him, come back and tell me so that I can go and worship him too. After this interview, the wise men went their way, and the star they had seen in the east guided them to Bethlehem. It went ahead of them and stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were filled with joy. They entered the house and saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. Then they opened their treasure chests and gave him the gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. When it was time to leave, they returned to their own country by another route, for God had warned them in a dream not to return to Herod. So this may be a story that you've heard before, but questions are going to pop on the screen, and I want you guys to discuss it after hearing that story. In your groups, go for it. Don't be afraid. So what stuck out to you in the story? What were the wise men doing, and how does this relate to you? Like I said, this whole story is going to relate to what we see and how we see it. But let's unpack it a little more. You guys discussed and you guys got to share a little bit of what you think it meant. I think it's very important to break down what's actually going on in this story and understand more or less what's actually happening rather than complete details. Because along the way, someone decided that there was three of them. In my story, I don't think it said that there was three, did it? No. And then then along the way, sometimes they got names. Like I know one of them was Casper. Bartholomew, right? What? The friendly ghost? I don't know if he was a ghost. He was wise and he was a man, but he may. But they got names. And maybe it was their names. It, it might have been their names, but I didn't see that in the text that I read. But as we start to, to study this and break it down, the first question I ask myself, well, who were the wise men? You know, we see this important story about how these guys come and bring their gifts to Jesus and they traveled far and they followed a star. But who were the wise men? Well, what's important to know about the wise men is they were also called magi at that time. Magi comes from the name, comes from the word magicians or mages, these people that were like modern day astrologers. These people would look at the stars and see the stars. They would, they may have been royal um, in like the royal court, not really royalty themselves, but they were involved in looking at signs and wonders going on in the sky or something along that nature. So that's who these magi were. Another thing that's important is realizing that they traveled far, and we're going to get a little into this later, but based on the time it took them to arrive, we can realize that maybe they came from around the area of Iran, even further out, maybe by China. So you see that these men traveled quite some distance to see this baby and bring him their gifts. And then that's what kind of led me to the question, well, what led them to Jesus? What, what made them decide to take this long journey? Being these men, I mean, if we look at who the, the magi and the wise men were, we can realize that if they're from a different area, they weren't Jews, so they didn't really recognize uh, God as Yahweh, God as the king of their life. So there are these people, maybe they were Buddhists, you know, maybe, maybe uh, they, they, they were Hindu, maybe based on where they were from, they didn't even follow this idea of who God was, this, this idea of Yahweh, which is something we'll get to later on this month. But, so these men traveled such a far distance for what reason? What led them to the baby Jesus? Well, the story says that a star appeared in the sky, and what better way for magi or these magicians to be led than by the things they look at all the time? Like I said, these guys would look at stars and look for signs and wonders and look for things that they could kind of interpret and, and bring to people. And they see this star, this supernatural thing happening in the sky, and they're like led to follow the star. We all know that about the wise men, the three wise men, they followed a star to Jesus. So what led them to baby Jesus? It was a star, it was a supernatural occurring, but they were spoken to in their language. They were drawn by the sky. And then why did they come? Anyone remember why they decided to go and visit this baby? They said it to King Herod in the story. Anyone? Based on a prophecy? What did they say to King Herod? Anybody remember? Nobody? He said, they said to him, we're looking for the king of the Jews. We saw a star appear and we decided to follow it and we're looking for the king of the Jews. 
Why did they come? And as we study this more and more, we can actually see that this journey was very important to them. You see, they followed the star to, to come to Jesus. They were looking for the king of the Jews, this baby that maybe they heard about. And they were following the star and they were looking for Jesus. And we realized it was very important because if you do the math, it probably took them a little bit around two years to actually get to Jesus. We so often see that Jesus is a baby when the wise men came to see him and that he's there with the shepherds and all this stuff is happening. But if you do some of the math and you start to look at things and realize it was maybe not exactly two years, but Jesus was a little bit older than a complete baby, baby newborn at the time when the wise men came. This was an important journey for them. And why did they come? What did they ultimately do when they got to see Jesus? They gave him gifts. So they brought him something special from them to him. So these wise men journeyed one and a half, two years to see this baby because a star in the sky appeared to them and they followed it and they wanted to give gifts to this king of the Jews. Now I wonder, was it simply the star that led them? Had they heard stories about them? Maybe they heard the prophecies. Maybe they were just interested in this thing in the sky and along the way they heard a baby was born and they said, oh, maybe that's, you know, related. The star's over there. What led them to Jesus? What brought them there? I I don't know. Maybe it was God speaking to them through their own language. These people that were not even Jews, maybe God was saying, you look at the stars, we'll follow this star and I'm going to show you the true light that will guide you. I don't know what exactly guided them, But I found it very interesting, the response that these wise men found as they started encountering people in the area. When they got there, and you can go back to the verse, they uh, they said, where is this newborn king of the Jews? Do you have it? Where is this newborn king of the Jews? We We saw his star as it rose, and we have come to worship him. Next one. King Herod was deeply disturbed when he heard this, as was everyone else in Jerusalem. That's the response they got. So these men, not Jews, not even people who followed God, decided to go and search out this baby, search out this baby king. They call him the king of the Jews. He's in Jerusalem. Uh, the, The wise men are in Jerusalem, and he says, this is what we're here for. We're here to see this king of the Jews. Now, obviously, King Herod could probably be a little upset because if I'm the king and someone's saying they're looking for the king of the Jews, but not talking about me, I'd be a little upset. I'd be deeply disturbed if I heard someone was looking for a king other than me in my own territory. So King Herod, we get that. That's understandable. But why was everyone else in Jerusalem, Jews who knew who God was, who knew the prophecies, who knew that the Messiah or the Savior was coming, why would the Jews be deeply disturbed that other people are looking for him as well? Any thoughts? Jealousy? Okay, it's possible. Charlie? Okay, so that's a way of being disturbed. That's good. Shock. Yeah. Good. Maybe they were in shock. Maybe they were jealous. I don't know... What they were, maybe they were split. Maybe they all, you know, kind of had different feelings about it. Maybe they were just completely unaware of what was going on. You see, these people were waiting for a savior to come and save them from the people that were enslaving them. So maybe they weren't really interested in a baby being born in a manger, in a barn, in a horse's food dish is where Jesus was born. So maybe they weren't quite interested. Maybe they just missed him and they didn't realize what was going on. But these men, these wise men knew what was going on. And that's what got me thinking. It got me thinking because these wise men saw something in this baby. These wise men realized something was different about this child or the area this child was in. They were led to it. And how often in my life, when I look at God, do I see a child or a baby or something I'm not really interested in or something that I might be missing when I should be reacting like the wise men and seeing a king who wants to rule over my life, a king who wants to lead me in my life. And I found that is the story and the message of the epiphany, this thing that we celebrate. It's man recognizing the king who is God. You see, the wise men, they saw a king while everyone else saw a simple baby. This 
is what we're talking about when we talk about the epiphany. It's what we see when we look at God. These men had gifts for him. They had to have gifts. They were compelled to. They saw this star and they had to come. As they told Herod, we were led here. They couldn't deny it. They couldn't, they couldn't push it aside. There was a king that was owed worship and they had to bring their gifts all the way to him. Where everyone saw a simple baby, the Magi saw a king worthy of worship. And I want to challenge you in your life where you are. These next nine weeks that are coming following this, we're doing a series that's called This Is Your God. And I think the most important thing to do before we go in and we break it down and we're going to go into different aspects of who God is, we're going to look at the different names of God and try to see who he actually is, you need to actually open your eyes and be willing to look. Because so often I make God small unless I need him. When I'm in trouble and I need God, I see a king. I need you, God. You're here. I need you to help me. I need you to save me. But when I'm doing everything right, when I'm going my own way and I'm comfortable, I see a baby and I walk right past him. I put him right back in the manger and I don't see the king that the wise men saw. And as we begin to unpack these names of God, we're going to look at eight different names of God. You will know your God. You will know this God. You will see him for who he actually is. You will open your eyes and begin to experience him because this is your God and he wants to know you. And not only does God want to know you, this is very important. Something I learned a little while ago is that God doesn't just want to know you. He wants to be known by you. That's really, really important in relationships. It's one thing to know somebody. It's one thing for me to know my wife, Janelle, but to be known by somebody and still be accepted and still be loved, she knows everything about me, and she chooses to love me. So God, you guys are going to get to know this God. This God, your God, you're going to get to know him. He wants to know you, and he wants to be known by you. So why is this important? Why is it important for us to recognize this story, this message in the, in the epiphany, man recognizing who the king is. Why is this important for you going into this next nine-week period and leading up to BYMC? It's important because when you recognize and see who God is, it becomes easier to praise him. When you don't know something about him, when you don't know anything about God, when you haven't experienced the goodness of God, you can't praise him. There's no reason to praise him. If I tell you that God is worthy of praise and God is great, what does that do for you until you experience it and recognize it for yourself? And that's what we're talking about today. That's what's so important today because once I started to recognize and see who God was, I began to experience things in my life that I never would have dreamed. And as I experienced them, I was hungry to know God more, so I kept looking for him. And then I would experience more things. And the more that I I, I seeked him out, the more I looked for God and the more I experienced him, the more I saw how great he was and I was compelled. I was drawn like the wise men took this long journey. I'm sure they met hardships. I'm sure they saw things that they weren't ready to see that they were afraid of, but they still did it because they recognized how worth it it was to see this king, but also give their gifts to him. Praise him. Give him what he deserves and what he's owed. This happens somewhere else in the Bible as well. There's a psalm. Have you guys ever read psalms? Anybody? Anybody? Hold on a second. You want to play like a, oh, it's going to make it really deep. There you go. Have you guys ever read the book of Psalms? Anything? Well, what happens is in Psalms 22, we have this guy, David. He was a king of Israel, and David is writing his heart. Pretty much Psalms are like David pouring his heart on the paper. He whines an awful lot. He's quite the complainer but he recognizes who he's talking to. But when we look at this Psalm 22, David is like doing the usual. Why have you left me, God? Where have you been? Why did you abandon me? All this bad stuff is happening to me. Where are you? This is often what David does. And how often have you prayed the same prayer? Where are you, God? My parents don't love me. My friends abandon me. I feel like an outcast. I don't feel like I'm good enough. Where are you, God? And as we develop more in, the, in Psalm 22, this, this poem that David is writing to his God, uh, he stops Like in the middle of this sad poem and depressed journal entry he's writing, and he says, But you're God. You're still God. And you rest on the praise of your people. 
Where are you, God? My life is a mess. I can't do it. I, I can't handle it. You left me. You abandoned me. But you're still God. And you rest on the praise of your people. You see, David stopped and he realized in the middle of everything, he, he adjusted what he saw like a bunny and a duck, like a magnifying glass and a coffee mug. He changed the way he looked at things. And in the middle of his worries, he recognized the king and he said, but you're still God and you deserve my praise. You're still God and I owe my praise to you. I owe my worship, my gifts to you. Another way of saying it is that God inhabits or lives within the praises of his people. Now, I love that. That is awesome because what that tells me is the more that I praise God, the more God comes. The more that I lift up God's name, the more God comes. Have you ever sat through like a worship service or like a song that maybe the band has done and as you sit there, you kind of feel like nothing's happening and you're just like this? Well, God inhabits the praise of his people. He rests and sits on the praises that you bring. This is your God. And he, re he rests and sits on your praise. So if you're sitting here like this and wondering where God is, maybe that has something to do with it. So as we learn these names of God and as we unpack this series and get to understand who God is and what he's done in our lives, I want to start it off first by recognizing that he's worthy of our praise simply because he's God. And I'm going to ask you guys to do something crazy. I'm going to ask you to stand up. That wasn't the crazy part yet. That's the easy part. And you put all your money in the front. No, don't do that. I'm just kidding. And this is what I'm going to ask you to do. You may have the suckiest life in your mind right now. You may be going through the worst thing in your life. But I want you to stop for a minute and think of a time that God showed up huge in your life. Think of a moment, just like David did, God, I'm having the worst time ever, but you're still God. You, you are still God and you are deserving of my praise and you will fill the praises that I bring you because the wise men recognized as they brought gifts that they were giving gifts to a king who deserved it, who was owed it, and we can do the same. The epiphany is man recognizing the kingship of God. And we can start celebrating that today. So this wonderful band is going to lead us in a pretty simple song. And if you don't know the words, they're on the screen. And I want you to sing as loud, as off-key, if you sing bad like me. I want you to jump up and down, lift your hands in the air, do whatever it takes. But God is king and he's owed praise. And as we praise him, he what? fills them. He inhabits them. So what better way to start this? Before we even look at the names of God and who he is, than to worship him. Are you guys ready to worship? Just the one song. It's not going to hurt. So give it your best shot and let's see how God shows up in our praises. got a clap. And while that may be weird for you to do, keep doing it. Keep doing it. Don't come here and sit in your seats and shrink God down to this size like a baby. But recognize the baby king that the wise men saw. This king that came to usher in a new era, to change everything. This is your God. And in the next eight weeks, you will get to know him a little bit more. And our prayer for you is that you may come to see that God is worthy of your praise because he's king. Our prayer is that you, like the wise men, would bring your gifts, maybe not gold or frankincense or what the heck is myrrh, but maybe it's your hands, maybe it's your voice, maybe it's your service. May you come to see that this is your God and that he is great. Amen. 
You've been listening to the Bridge United Podcast. We'd love to have you join us live every Sunday at 3.15 p.m. in the Liberty Center in Elizabeth, New Jersey. You can follow us on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram at Bridge Youth. See you next week.